All right, so we are finishing Colossians today, and if you're joining us on a Sunday that you weren't here for the rest, don't worry, they, they segmented, so you won't, we won't be missing out anything other than the first three books. But uh, just something around the, the behind story of what it is, we're calling it the Bible in action, and this series is where we take a book in the Bible and find attributes and behaviors crucial or beneficial to our walk with God. So something that's really near and dear to my heart is I absolutely believe in the God that we serve. I believe that he's powerful. I believe he's present. I believe that he does miracles, signs, wonders, and we have an incredible privilege not only to enjoy him, but to also participate. And so it's, you know, something for me in in leading the church, being the elder and with an eldership team is to be able to have the saints operating in that same experience, that when you're at work, when you're doing whatever you're doing, you're hearing God, and you're excited because He's doing it with you. And so to me, this specific purpose, how we've gone through this, isn't around necessarily the understanding to the depths of the context and unpacking the Scriptures, but it's leaving us with actionable intelligence to be able to live what God has called us to live out. So with that, let's get into it. I'm going to read all the way through. Last week, we ended with Colossians 4 verse 1. But I felt we'll do it again, and there is more that's, that's added into it in this context. So masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Tychius will give you a full report about how I am getting along. He is a beloved brother and faithful helper who serves with me in the Lord's work. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing, and to encourage you. I'm also sending one, one is miss, one is miss. I don't know how you say that. One's, one is miss. <laughs> Dumela one is miss. Who is a faithful and beloved brother, one of your own people. He and Tychius will tell you everything that's happening here. Ar- <laughs> Articus, Artorsicus, who is in prison with me, Sends you his greetings, and so does Mark. Sure, that's an easy one. Barnabas' cousin. As you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. Jesus, the one we call Justice, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jewish believers among my co-workers. They are working with me here for the kingdom of God, and what a comfort they have been. Epaphras, a member of Your own fellowship and a servant of Christ Jesus sends you his greetings. He always prays earnestly earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect, fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. I can assure you that he prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved doctor, sends his greetings and so does Demas. Please give my greetings to other brothers and sisters at Lysodea, and to Nympha and the church that meets in a house. After you've read this letter, pass it on to the church at Lysodea so that they can read it too. And you should read the letter I wrote to them. And say to Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry of the Lord that he gave you. Here is my greeting in my own writing, Paul. Remember my chains, may God's grace be with you. So just something that I thought that I'd color in for you, because if you've been here through the whole series, if you want to call it, we, we have a lot of instruction, but as this letter that he's written comes to a close, there's a lot more interaction about names mentioned as he's literally like closing off his letter, like you and I would if you still remember what it was like to actually write a letter to somebody. I don't know if you ever did that, if you under the line where you don't even remember holding a pen in your hand, it shows you how we've progressed. But I still remember actually at school having to remember where you must write, where the person's address must go, and then you have to write in the different context, dear, how, now it's, what's up? 
Not literally WhatsApp. It's literally like, what's up? How are you? What's up? And it doesn't matter who that person is. The, 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 the status quo has changed quite a lot. But in this closing of his letter, I just thought it would be intriguing that I don't ever remember writing somebody a letter, whether it be an official document or a love letter saying, this is Keith, I write with my own hand. <laughs> so what that's about is where he was, guys would actually write and he would scribe. So he'd be talking like this and he'd be speaking or sitting and somebody would be writing. And then almost like a, a sense of putting his personal touch on it, he would take that parchment or whatever the thing is that they've written on and then he would write there, and this is Paul. And the guys would be like, oh, wow, he signed with his own name. How cool is that? That's just some trivial information for you. It's not really of great importance. What I want to kick off with is first in verse 1, and he's talking about the, the, the leaders. To me, this is a sobering reminder. It doesn't matter what position you have. And so in our generations at the moment, they're making much of trying to swap around God's order and structure. So it doesn't, to me, really matter at what position you lead, who is, should I say, under you in responsibility. What this scripture is really highlighting for me is that nobody is truly at the top. You know, if you, if you are saved in Christ, whatever you are operating, whether you've got company, companies, multiples, trust, whatever it is, servants, whatever the scope or dynamic is, you're a custodian under God. And there's this constant reminder that when you're working with those people that to the, to the human eye, it looks like they're living just for you. There's this reminder in saying that actually, truly, you are under me. So as you're a custodian of them, so your heavenly Father who sees how you are leading people and loving people, your behavior, your conduct, he is observing that, and we have to give an account for every word that we speak, which includes those that we lead. So I thought that was not something of a stick, but you know, for us sometimes it's not um, that we would intentionally make life about us, but sometimes if we don't put safeguards in place, then the natural human nature can take over. So to me, it's like when you speaking a lot to ladies. I'm married to this beautiful lady in front. So what I do is when I meet another lady, whether she's married or single, I make sure that there's other people in proximity for what reason to safeguard the quality of this marriage so that her reputation, my reputation stays intact. And so I can say, but my heart is clean. I'm never cheat on my wife. The minute I say that, I actually lie to myself and create an opportunity for the enemy to rule and reign in that specific area. Rather to put these things in place. So as a leader, what are you putting in place so that you actually don't buy your own nonsense? That you can stay humble. So point one is this, lead and lead well. But lead as one who must give an account to him who can see through all of you. I can put on this face on a Sunday, Chris, how's it, my man? Look at Tommy, Tommy. Then on this side, I'm a horrible human being. Or vice versa. Two to four. There's a strong call to prayer. And then there's a certain type of person that he's talking about. You know, you can focus on the quality of prayer, but the quality of prayer is only a reflection of the person praying. Have you thought about that? A lot of times we want to make, a, make much around how we pray. But what we are praying is a reflection of the quality of our relationship. So to me, there was something uh, intentional that he was highlighting on the person, not on the prayer, is saying the person needs to be sharp, enthusiastic, and grateful. Have you considered what is the, the quality of your prayers? Have you assessed how it is and what the focus is, the majority of your prayers? Notice what he's asking for. Here he's, he's, the context here is he's actually in prison or under house arrest. He can't go anywhere, can't do whatever he wants to do. And so who of you would be in that situation and be praying for opportunities for the gospel? Somebody whose lifestyle 
They've encountered Christ in a meaningful way that they, are, they cannot do what they want to do. And so the modern Christian has actually been really primed by Satan because most of the words that come out of the mouth is, God would not let me suffer. God wouldn't want me to, to, to have a bad life. God wouldn't want me to be in this circumstance. So I'm not speaking about a defeatist. I'm talking about somebody that has a revelation that Christ has already set them apart for an eternal walk with them. You cannot be separated from the creator of heaven and earth. So with that revelation, whatever circumstance you're in, you're drawing from that to advance. There's a clear message. So to me, that's a constant reminder as well. You know, when we're praying, you know, sometimes we can just ramble. But when we have a revelation and we have a conviction, the message is clear. And so sometimes you can stand there and you can have an absolute revelation of what you know you need to say. And you can say, Lord, I pray that the evidence of your work be revealed immediately, that the minds and the hearts would be transitioned and transformed exactly the way that you have under your submission and your authority right now in Jesus' name. Amen. But people would still want you to pray for another 20 minutes for it to really be powerful. There was a lady that came to see me at the business once, and I didn't know what it was for, but they had heard that when I pray for people sometimes, because I don't have the authority to say when it's going to happen, but then supernatural healings transpire. So the lady came into the business. I was busy selling tires. They said, this is the lady. I said, I'll see you right now. Went to the office. She wanted to tell me what it was. I thought God said, don't. I, start, I say to her, I'm going to take you by the hands. I'm going to pray for you in Jesus' name. Whatever it is that you need, do you believe that he can heal you? She said, yes. I said, great. We prayed. I said, Father, you know exactly what's happening and transpiring in this body. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. You are the creator that made this body. I said, be healed in Jesus' mighty name, full healing and restoration. She had tears in her eyes. I said, thank you very much. Have a nice day. She left. She had terminal cancer. And they showed the, the x-rays or whatever it is, and God removed it completely. It was less than five minutes in a working day, God did that work. All I did was execute the obedience. So the quality of your prayer is the revelation that you have of him. That's it. So you can go study it further and pull it apart. I'm not undermining that. I'm just saying in its simplest form, that's what we can do. That's what we're looking at here, the actionable things of God's word. So point two, the focus of your prayers reveals the treasures of your heart. In verse five to six, it has a reflection. It's talking about a considering the way that you live. And then there's an instruction to me, which I find there, which talks about get wisdom. And to me, the importance of getting wisdom in the next component that I discovered there is so that you would know what opportunity looks like. Wisdom is the difference between a fool's errand versus a reward. And sometimes there is a measure of faith that you don't know what is going to transpire. But to me, a fool's errand, when you're obeying what God's told you to do, when others cannot see it, is different. So to me, when I have a blind faith, there is no such thing. That's just deception. Because what I observe in God's word is that when I receive an instruction from an invisible God, and I act on that in believing in him, because I cannot see him, that is faith. And my scriptural tether there is always Jesus with the centurion. When Jesus says, when this guy says, you say, Jesus, what I must do, and I know that if you say it, it will be done. He says no greater faith, but for you and I, what that is, is obedience. You give the instruction, I'll do it, and it will come to pass. And that was an intriguing component there, where to develop conversational skills with purpose. I think a lot of times we unintentionally are rather selfish. Because we look for those people that we connect with easily. We don't really consider to allow friendship to cost us anything. I almost challenge you and say, if, if you have got people that you love, but it hasn't cost you anything, it's not really a friendship. 
you probably find that they're carrying the bag most of the time. And it's because of the generosity in them that the quality of that friendship is what it is. Consider this to develop conversational skills with purpose. Point three, wisdom is attainable. Silence is only golden when you lack wisdom. People don't know who you are unless you open your mouth. People sometimes wish that I would keep my mouth closed because they don't really want to know about me anymore because I'm somebody that will easily converse. But it's a skill that you develop that wasn't always the case for me. It takes effort. But when you have a purpose of why you would do it, is that the gospel be made known, is that when you're consumed with Christ and you're looking because you believe that the advantage that you have of knowing Christ, you want the other person to know, and you're living from that revelation, you would endeavor to develop those skills to relate with other people, whether they have the same interest as you or not. Seven to 18 is a lot of where the greeting comes to a close, and he highlights different names and people. So I thought what I would do here is we'd break it up and just highlight some of the things that I observe in the way that he's going about this. So the first point that I'd highlight is the letter is written from prison. So for me, that was important because his location does not undermine his purpose, his value, his conviction, and he is not consumed with bitterness or resentment, uh, feeling sorry for himself. He's a man on a mission. In his writing, it lacks any sense of self-preservation. I mean, the reason why he's in prison is for preaching the gospel. So what does he do from prison? If you would hope to get out of prison, what would you stop doing? The thing that got you in there. So he lacks any sense of self-preservation, sense of feeling sorry for himself. So here's something to denote for us in our lives, is suffering for sin is not the same as suffering for Christ. Do you know the difference? To me, that's where the Bible, good relationships come in handy, eldership. So point four, ask yourself, are you now suffering for sin's sake or Christ's? If it's sin, repent. If it's for Christ, rejoice. Verses seven to nine, you see him sending people. And so that's intriguing to me because sometimes you would feel that your lack of authority, your position, your horrible boss, your wife that doesn't do what you say to do, your husband that's a hooligan, he's a bully, whatever it is that you're facing as a real reality. I'm not uh, trying to be sarcastic there. I'm just talking about the very real realities we find ourselves in. He is leading from prison. He has influence. So to me, this was quite important, the observation there. The condition of your mind is your only prison. As a man believes in his heart, we just say that stuff. Heck, I was so smart. Yes, it just rolls so easily off the tongue. The thing that we must remember about the Bible to inspire ourselves is that it, it has no waste in it. So when that is said, it's actually a truth that is tried and tested. Here's a man that's a beneficiary of it. Let's write it down so that you and I can experience that. Opportunity presents to the focused. Remember, he was talking about when you're praying, look for those that are energized. Why? Because there are people that are focused. Here's a man that he's in prison, he's trapped, he can't go anywhere, but he is not complacent, he is not reluctant, he is focused. Opportunity presents itself to the focused. And so if you've been in a, in a lull for a while, what we would need to consider is the quality of our mind is eroding our opportunity to be creative. Any negative emotion will suppress your creativity. Any negative emotion will suppress your creativity, your ability to act, to be creative, to come up with ideas and opportunity. 
It's why fear, anxiety, and stress, they are not your friends. They are not the motivation to get things done. One guy once said to me, but if I do not have these things, I will not be able to drive my companies because this is the energy that I actually need to make it happen. So I said to him, okay, so what you're telling me is you need to use demonic power to actually advance the kingdom. And he was like, wait, whoa, whoa, how can you say that? I said, because the manner that you need to live, fear, anxiety, and stress is not what created the universe. Now, if the one that can create the universe can speak it out like that without any negativity, what can you do? Because that power is in you and I. He inspires others. In his writing, the whole time, he's inspiring others. And you might think to yourself, but I've got nothing to inspire. I, I, don't, I have to walk to work. I don't even have, you understand, all the things that you're entertaining in your mind. What has God given you? There's a confidence to walk in that. Because at the very least, if you have nothing in this life, if you have Christ, you have everything. And your value has to start there, nowhere else. If it's external, it will rob you of peace and joy. So point five would be to look for opportunities for your life to be an example. Let the application of truth in your own life be the accreditation people need to follow you. So a lot of times we want to be a leader, but what have you got to offer that other people would find it worthy to follow? So if nobody paid you, would they follow you? If you didn't pay somebody, would they follow you? So I'll read that again. Let the application of truth in your own life be the accreditation people need to follow you. And in, five, and in 10 to 15, he has space for people and mission. He's transparent, encouraging, and speaks well of others. He is relational in his communication. You know, sometimes we can get to a place where we believe what we do is the reason why we relate with other people. If we don't have anything to do, suddenly the people's value to us diminishes. So if a person can't help you achieve your objective, eh, not important. If they don't have the same passion, energy, and drive that you have about that specific thing, eh. So there's something here of his ability to appreciate every different kind of person, whatever space or stage they're in at life. He is able to communicate and able to relate with them and connect with them. So when I say, if you're somebody that's got a lot of energy, if you're somebody that's got a lot of drive, if you've got the people that you are leading need not only to experience what you do, but who you are. And if all you are is what you do, you're in a lot of trouble. You really are in a lot of trouble. Why? Because the minute you cannot do through whatever reason, I got sick for four years. You know, it's like a high-performance supercar cruising down the road, and the next minute, engine buzz. And you, you look good, but you can't go anywhere. So the smoke's coming out the back. You pull into the pits. And if you've built around you people only for what you're doing, suddenly they peel away. And you realize that you've built your value, your identity and worth around your mission. And if people have, you've drawn like-minded people around you that only are mission-oriented, you'll find yourself alone. It's not the way that God's designed us to live. He's called us to live in relationship. You know, what we do here is connecting other people back to God. If you unpack all of the different works that you could possibly keep yourself busy with in the name of Jesus, there is only one underlying mission that he actually has. Chris, I love you. Sarah, I love you. You are mine again. And now that I have you, I get to do life with you. If you, if you simplified it right down to the nuts and bolts, that's the only mission he's ever had. And that mission ends at a purpose. person. It doesn't end up at a purpose. It doesn't end up at a project. It doesn't end up at some accomplished work. It ends up with you personally connected to him. 
never to be separated from him again. And when your aim, whatever you're busy doing, whatever vehicle you're using to get there, make sure that it's aiming at the person. And what will happen is you'll be productive, but your bus will also be filled with relational people because either they will be purpose oriented but while they're purposefully orientated with you, who is personally connected, their hearts will transition and they will meet him too. But if you just have purpose out front, you will accomplish many, many, many things. But people will be tools in your hand. And so you will use them, and when they can no longer be used, you'll spit them out. And that is not the fabric of what we do and how we live. I know that's a very deep thing that I'm saying. And it, it's worth working out. But, and I mean, I dedicate my life to that. It's not easy. But we must understand that the ultimate prize at the end of the day is the person of Jesus Christ, the heavenly father. Not stuff, things, substances, callings, whatever. So point six. Without relationship, our mission has no purpose. And the scripture that's very important to me that ties that is 1 John 4.20, which speaks about the love that God gives us and the love that we need to have for other people. Think about it. What is love actually? What is its purpose? What do you get? Do you get cars? Do you get houses? Do you get money? Do you get women? Do you get men? What do you get? Nothing. It's a verb. It's something that you give. It costs you. And the other person benefits. So without relationship, our mission has no purpose. Build a relationship with somebody that can add absolutely nothing to your life. Absolutely nothing. Try that. 16 to 18. He believes. You know, to live in a condition like this throughout your entire life, the minute you receive Christ, you're under persecution, you're being chased, you're being hounded, you're being... All kinds of things. He believes. He believes he has written to be, he believes what he has written to be valuable. So how do we know this? You know, when you have a personal revelation of something and it serves you well, you automatically want to say to somebody, hey man, you need to go see this guy. You, you need this thing in your life. This coffee machine makes the best coffee. Whatever it is, you start to speak about it. And so for him, you know, he's written this. So I think there's a rebuke for us, particularly as South Africans, that if you are a really good plumber or a really good builder, and somebody says, who's a builder? I need somebody. And you have a balanced viewpoint of yourself, which means you know you make mistakes, but you're also passionate about what you do, and you're good. Will you have the confidence to stick up your hand? I believe 90% of this room wouldn't do it. And sometimes the guy that sticks up his hand shouldn't. So just by ending on that, somebody goes, okay, well, then I'll never put up my hand again. Now, that's, that's the indoctrination that we've received, is there's this cloning that you shouldn't stand out. I believe that God's people should constantly be standing out. And they shouldn't be known about what they're not doing. They should be known for the ones that are doing things that nobody would ever dream of doing. And that they actually come to pass. And that they're done with excellence. So he actually, he writes to these guys. Then he says, once you've read it, pass this on to the guys of the Odyssea. And then also, remember to get what I wrote to them for you to read also. He believes and then there's a reminder to carry out the ministry. So point seven, it, to me, is quite important. Because you can be brought up in church. You can be raised with a type of Christian values. Which when I say Christian values, I'd say Christian morality. But Christian morality has got nothing to do with Christ-likeness. You might identify Christian morality in somebody who has Christ-likeness. But the dis difference between Christian morality and Christ-likeness is the one who is Christ-like will submit to him even unto death. That will love something 
and they will have it taken away. And they will sit there and they'll go, this has been taken away. Now, this is the one who's Christ-like. And I will not let it determine my joy, my energy, and my efforts because I have already received God. The one who has Christian morality will say, God never took this away. It's the other people. It's this person. I will stand here and I will claim this thing and I will not move until God gives it to me. Do you notice the difference between the two? The difference is the one builds towards Christian morality, which believes in a sense of self-righteousness, that the way that I conduct myself is pleasing to God in itself. Whereas the one who is aimed at Christ alone, his entire existence is attached to the one, the person. And so he's prepared to endure anything and everything because it is about him. And you can only do that if you have point seven. Do you actually believe and live by a conviction stronger than the value of your own life? To live like that day in and day out. And so you might not have that, but these types of messages give us the opportunity to true up. Maybe you look at your compass, which is hearing the word of God, and you're way off track. You just stop, you repent, you turn, and you move in the other direction. That's the freedom that you have in Christ. No longer any condemnation, just turn. So in summary, if salvation was Christ's only aim, then surely we would be done now. Have you thought about that? If Christ's death and resurrection was only for salvation, then surely you would just like be swept up immediately. You know what I mean? I don't know about you, but God's outside of time. So if he already knows who's going to be saved, not going to be saved, you know, like in that instant transaction, everything's done. So there must be something else. And in Colossians 1.24, Paul writes there, Now I rejoice in my sufferings. This is in the ESV translation. So if it's up there, it's not going to be the right wording. Is it? Oh, Elizabeth, sharp cookie, man, I like it. So now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Interesting wording. For the sake of his body that is the church. So here's where it's very, very important around the English, because the, the focus is here in Christ's afflictions, it's actually talking about where the actual focus is. It's not on Christ's uh, um, lacking, but it's actually speaking of something that was done as a result of somebody else or something else, which its focus then is for the sake of his body, which is you and I. So there is something that as Christ ascends, the Holy Spirit comes. You've heard me speak before where I've said, I believe that the first humiliation for Satan was Jesus on the cross. Because, I mean, if you know the battle plan, if you know the strategy that to end you is Jesus on the cross, what is the thing that you're going to endeavor to do? Keep him off of the cross. Then the second one is you and I walking in obedience, filled with the Spirit of God, living in such a way that Christ glorified be on display. And in so is the second humiliation for Satan, is that those who were powerless, now filled with Christ, are able to do the very work that Christ has set out to do, that they would in fact do it. And so to me, it's speaking about this, that Christ's affliction and that it's in its lack is where he's reserved the space. Now, I'm not talking about the finished work of justification. Christ's done that fully and completely for all of us. What I'm referring to is that we are still living on this earth in a fallen state, and there must be a reason, there must be a purpose, and it is because he has faith in himself that he's deposited in you and I to do the work that he set before us. That is incredibly important because what is that? A vote of confidence for you, for you, for you, for you, for each and every one of you that he has said that the power, the ability that I've placed in you is enough for your obedience and to fulfill everything that I've called you to do. Everything. 
Otherwise, the scripture wouldn't say for us to be perfect as he is perfect. So the enemy has infiltrated our camps to tell us that you are fallen. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot. Those are the lies. For the church of Jesus Christ arises. We have work to do to fulfill that which he has called us to do. Christ's completed work is not in question. That's the justification. I believe it speaks to the purpose of our own lives, heralding the message and representing his kingdom in our areas of influence and responsibility. So if you've heard me preach before, it's saying that not everyone is called to stand here and to preach the gospel. But if he's called you to build a business, if he's called you to do whatever it is in Christ, there should be the evidence of him speaking to you, leading you, and guiding you because of this. And you would experience that in your area of influence and responsibility, that we'd be a living testament to our living God. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that your word is absolutely filled with purpose, with direction, with revelation. And Father, as this word is shared, I realize that this is a sea of people that are different spaces in their lives. And so this word goes out as a blanket and it can hook on each one where his heart is at. But I know that the one who is able to meet us there is you, Holy Spirit. And so thank you that you said that you would never leave us on our own. You will send us the Holy Spirit and he will speak to us about things to come, about you and what is yours. And so I pray as your sons and your daughters are sitting here listening and they might have a lot of questions. I ask, Lord, because of the faithful one that you are, that right now where they are, that you could give them peace, that you could settle them. The curiosity that they have, Father, I pray that you would, that you would entertain that, that you would journey with them on that road of discovery. And for those that still struggle with doubt, I ask, Father, would you forgive them? Would you help their unbelief? And thank you, Father, that you constantly remind me that you are not intimidated by our sin. You have forgiven our sin. And so, Father, I pray for each one as they go that their hearts would be rejuvenated, re-energized with a great sense of excitement. First, to have an encounter with you, to hear you, and to walk out that which you give an instruction to do. I thank you, Father God, that you never leave us nor forsake us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.